Hawara, near the Fayum oasis, might not look as much today, but in historical accounts, it is a somewhat legendary place. Here's a quote by a classical author. This I have actually seen, a work beyond words. For if anyone put together the buildings of the Greeks and display of their labors, they would seem lesser in both effort and expense to this labyrinth. Even the pyramids are beyond words. Yet the labyrinth surpasses even the pyramids. These are the words of ancient historian Herodotus, describing his visit to a colossal multi-level structure named Labyrinth, said to contain 3,000 rooms full of hieroglyphs and paintings, and yet no archaeological evidence. So you can see why historians felt Herodotus was embellishing an account, especially considering the father of history's horrific reputation with regards to accuracy. With time, however, more and more of Herodotus's accounts from Hawara have been vindicated. In the extract from the account of Lake Maris given by Herodotus, he mentioned two pyramids, each of which rose 93 meters above the surface of the water and stood in the middle of the lake. And the historian declares that on each pyramid was a stone statue seated on a throne. The statues, according to Professor Petrie, who excavated some parts of them, were seated colossi of about 18 meters in height, carved in hard quartzite sandstone and brilliantly polished. So the description of Herodotus, therefore, is fully accounted for, and it shows that he actually saw the figures and visited the place. Sounds like another win for Herodotus when the area around the Hawara Pyramid was researched with geo-radar and later space ground-penetrating technology that not only were in favor of his reports, but also discovered something phenomenal underground. But let's start with the Hawara Pyramid first and its technical marvel inside. Even though it looks like a pile of dark mud today, the pyramid has an ancient megalithic core of the highest quality. Hence, there is a clear presence of two completely different types of technologies, a superb dressed ancient megalithic stone core underneath the pile of mud breaks on top of it. It's flooded with ground salt water these days, which destroys the once brilliantly finished surfaces and blocks of the entrance passage. The quality of the entrance masonry and how tightly blocks are fitted together is outstanding. But this is nothing compared to what was first discovered in the 19th century. To our luck, it was Professor Flinders Petrie who was not only a brilliant archaeologist, but had a great eye for the technical side of things. Petrie noticed that the stone casing had been removed in Roman times, and as the body of the structure was of mud bricks, it had crumbled away somewhat. It's not even clear if it was originally a megalithic pyramid, because when he searched for the entry on the north side of it, he couldn't find anything. So it was evident then that the plan of this structure was entirely different to that of any known pyramids back then. The entrance was on the ground level, on the south side, near the southwest corner. Unlike other pyramids, the descending passage was adapted for the entrance and has steps and the ramps on both sides. The design is very similar to what the Laboratory of Alternative History researchers found in the Black Pyramid. The steps have two ramps on both sides and seem like the passage was adapted for moving some kind of cargo carts on wheels. Then there was discovered a system of passages and roofs with sliding trap doors. There are three known trap doors in that megalithic complex, each one weighing around 20 tons apiece. And this is probably the smallest weight in that structure. Petrie found that none of the trap doors had been slid into place and were left open. He wrote that while he was searching for a path to a sepulcher, no door was to be found, as the entrance had been by the roof, an enormous block of which had been let down into place to close the chamber. The way in had been forced by breaking away a hole in the edge of the glassy hard sandstone roofing block, and thus reaching the chamber and its two sarcophagi. Here is a mind-blowing thing. Quote, the chamber itself is a marvelous work. Nearly the whole height of it is carved out of a single block of hard quartzite sandstone, forming a huge tank in which the sarcophagus was placed." End of quote. So what happened was the rock, which is here a hardened sand, was excavated to form the central hollow or pit, 
which was intended to receive the sarcophagus chamber. Into this hollow in the rock, the enormous quartzite monolith chamber weighing over 110 tons, which was hewn out to form the sarcophagus chamber, was sunk, and the sarcophagus and two chests were next placed inside it. Then trenches which were to form the passages leading to it were cut also. Next on this incredible structure rested the horizontal slabs of stone, which were to form a kind of roof. The purpose of the false passages on Petrie's scheme, then, actually could serve the purpose. These exist not to confuse the robbers, but were an ingenious device. So the last great quartzite ceiling slab was lowered to close the box with the help of sand which had supported props holding up the block and was released via side tunnels, allowing the huge piece of stone slowly to descend to its resting place. Above these double roofs then comes the third roof of the slanting beams of limestone weighing about 55 tons. Now, it's not clear why they went with this exact design, when the huge carved monolith box sunk into the hollow in the rock that they've just finished. The whole structure looks like some kind of a protected stone vault. Here's what Flinders Petrie wrote about the megalithic quartzite tank inside. Quote, in the inside, it is 7 meters in length by 2 meters in width and 2 meters height, while the sides are about 1 meter thick. The workmanship is most excellent. The sides are flat and regular, the inner corners so sharply wrought that though I looked at them, I never suspected that there was not a joint there until I failed to find any joint in the sides, and the surface so polished that the hard flinty sandstone reflects the light of the candle one carries." End of quote. He noted that no trace of inscription exists on either the walls or sarcophagi, and but for the funereal furniture, even the very name would not have been recovered. Pretty strange for a pharaoh not to leave his name in a quote, tomb, after rendering such a masterpiece. Above all the megalithic elements is a completely different level of technology. The great brick arch was thrown over the whole of the masonry of the chamber, and the bricks of the pyramid were piled above it all. Now, there is an important moment. There is no entrance to the sepulcher. The sepulcher is roofed by three enormous slabs of the same hard quartzite sandstone, over 1.2 meters in thickness, and extending far beyond the chamber walls on each side. The original access to the chamber was closed by lowering one of these slabs, which weighs about 45 tons, into its place. So the only way for the mummy of the pharaoh to be placed inside then was on the stage of the construction of the pyramid, which is kind of ridiculous. Traces neither of bodies nor of coffins were found in the sarcophagi, of course, all that Petrie found were a few scraps of charred bones, besides bits of charcoal and grains of burnt diorite in the sarcophagi. It was evident that the content had been made of wood inlaid with polished stones. And it seems like whatever was found inside of this sarcophagus in ancient times, it was burned right there for some reason. Still, the question of the second sarcophagus was unsolved. The main sarcophagus is centered in the room, but the second one was distinctly a later addition, built after the pyramid was built, when no larger blocks could be brought in. It would be very interesting to compare the technical qualities of these two objects. This might not be the last secret that the Hawara pyramid holds, because there might still be hidden passages connected to the other magnificent megalithic system underground. On the south of the pyramid lay a wide mass of chips and fragments of structure, which had long been generally identified with the celebrated labyrinth of Egypt. When Petrie began to excavate the area in front of the Hawara pyramid, the result was soon plain, that the brick houses of a village were built on the top of the ruins of a great stone structure. Quote, Beneath them, and far away over a vast area, the layers of stone chips were found and so great was the mass that it was difficult to persuade visitors that the stratum was artificial and not a natural formation." End of quote. No trace of architectural arrangement could be found to help in identifying this great structure with the labyrinth, but the mere extent of it proved that it was far larger than any temple known in Egypt. 
The size of this megalithic structure used to be enormous. Here is what Flinders Petrie wrote, quote, All the temples of Karnak, of Luxor, and a few on the western side of Thebes might be placed together within the vast space of these buildings at Hawara. End of quote. We know from Pliny, the Roman army commander, and many others, how for centuries the labyrinth had been a great quarry for the whole district. And destruction of this wonder of Egypt occupied such a body of masons that a small town existed there. The fact that the labyrinth was not just another building is shown by its unusual size. It covered an area of about 28,000 square meters. And by all ancient reports, it was truly massive and megalithic. Here are the descriptions given by classical authors. Herodotus, 5th century BC, quote, They built a labyrinth a little above the lake of Maris. This I have myself seen, and found it greater than can be described. The pyramids likewise were beyond description. Yet the labyrinth surpasses even the pyramids. He continues, quote, for it has twelve courts enclosed with walls, with doors opposite each other, six facing the north and six the south, contiguous to one another, and the same exterior wall encloses them. It contains two kinds of rooms, some underground and some above ground over them, to the number of 3,000, 1,500 of each. Then he says that the rooms above ground he saw himself and related from personal inspection but the underground rooms he only knows from a report. He said that the Egyptians who were in charge of the building would on no account show him them, saying that they were the sepulchers of the kings who originally built this labyrinth and of the sacred crocodiles. Herodotus was so impressed by what he saw, he noted that it surpasses all human works. Not only Herodotus, other travelers who were there supported his reports. Here is how another ancient visitor, Strabo, describes the ceiling of the labyrinth. Quote, the most surprising circumstance is that the roofs of these dwellings consist of a single stone each, and that the covered ways through their whole range were roofed in the same manner with single slabs of stone of extraordinary size, without the intermixture of timber or of any other material. And the width of the hidden chambers is spanned in the same way by monolithic beams of outstanding size." End of quote. Strabo noted incredible megalithic work of the highest craftsmanship everywhere, including a line of 27 pillars, each consisting of a single stone. The walls also are, quote, constructed of stones not inferior in size to these. As to the date of the labyrinth, Pliny wrote that it was very ancient at his time, estimating that it was already going back 3,600 years ago. He was astonished by the solidity of this huge mass constructed, that the lapse of ages had been totally unable to destroy it. The way he describes the labyrinth is more like a megalithic city rather than one massive temple. He wrote that it would be impossible to describe the layout of that building and its individual parts, since it is divided into regions and administrative districts which are called gnomes each of the 21 gnomes giving its name to one of the houses. Pliny talks about columns from porphyry, maze of paths, ramps, porticos, stairs, subterranean chambers, and very interesting acoustic properties of the place in general. Quote, Some of the palaces are so peculiarly constructed that the moment the doors are opened, a dreadful sound like that of thunder reverberates within in total darkness. All of the ancient historians have similarities in describing multiple features of it. All of them admired it so much for its greatness, as it was inimitable for its workmanship. When Petrie excavated this area, he found a bed of flat-laid sand made of chips of stone rammed down, on which lay the pavement and walls of some enormous building, and over that lie thousands of tons of fragments of the destroyed walls. He measured that artificial stone Plato, and it covered an area about 304 meters long and 244 meters broad. He also made an assumption that this was a foundation of the legendary labyrinth now destroyed. But in 2008, there was a Mataha expedition that doubted that statement. 
The professional team of geophysicists, equipped with the ground-penetrating radar, conducted a survey under the foundation of Petrie. A vast grid of walls underneath the stone flat laid was discovered. Their conclusion was that this alleged foundation might very well be the roof of a still existing labyrinth. The results of the expedition were officially released by the National Research Institute of Astronomy and Geophysics at the workshop at Cairo, then published in the NRIAG Scientific Journal, and then exchanged at a public lecture at Geet University in front of the Belgian press. So it was huge news. But surprisingly for them, the results were covered up because Zahi Hawass from the Supreme Council of Antiquities of Egypt requested to stop communicating all results, intimidating the Mataha expedition team members with Egyptian national security sanctions. This delayed their report by two years, but it did not stop it though. In the press release, after two years of frustration and confusion, the expedition team stated that they confirmed the presence of archaeological features at the labyrinth area of several hectares. It has the prominent signature of vertical walls, an average thickness of several meters, that connects to shape nearly closed rooms, which are interpreted to be huge in number. So now the occurrence of big parts of the labyrinth as described by the classic authors has been officially verified. As stated in the paper, at the depth of 8 to 12 meters is a grid of gigantic size made of a solid material like a granite. Their conclusion then was that what Petrie found should be reconsidered as not a foundation, but the roof of the still existing labyrinth. An interesting detail. The massive grid structure of the labyrinth is also out of angle by 20 to 25 degrees from the Hawara pyramid orientation. Is there evidence that this structure is more ancient than the Hawara pyramid? Potentially going thousands of years back before? Polish expedition in 2015 that was working on mapping the site around the Hawara pyramid with ground penetrating radar reconfirmed existence of underground channels and very strong and clear anomaly on the north side of the pyramid and architectural remains on the eastern and southern sides. But no one had done space archaeology on this site until 2015, when Dr. Carmen Bolter and Geoscan Systems came into the game. So what Geoscan claims is that it has a technology that goes to live satellite feed and can detect anomalies some 6 kilometers deep underground, using proprietary processing techniques. Apparently, Geoscan Systems has a good record in the space archaeology industry. In one of the case studies, their findings were validated by two GPS ground survey results, and subsequently the remote scan work of another space archaeology company, Merlin Burroughs Limited, aligned to about 80% consistent. They scanned the area around the Hawara Pyramid from space, and here is their discovery. Two deep subterranean systems of two levels with chambers that don't connect. These are two completely separate levels that Dr. Bolter has marked as blue level at more than 18 meters depth and the red level at 40 meters depth. The area of this underground complex is truly monumental. It is 433 square meters or 81 football fields. Five of its chambers are bigger than the Olympic swimming pool. It is so big that Dr. Bolter compared its size to an airport that was taken and put underground. All but one chamber is bigger than the average size house. And that one chamber is still bigger than an average apartment. There are 31 chambers on the blue level. So they look random, but in fact, they are in decreasing order and none of the chambers are of the same size. The red level follows that. There are 32 chambers also following a descending pattern. The biggest chamber on the blue level is 1,819 square meters. It's massive enough to contain a Boeing 747 with folded wings. The biggest chamber on the red level is even bigger. The purple color is single passageways. The total length of just them is 1.4 kilometers. At this point, it is hard to say what exactly it is. Does it have anything on the walls or are they plain? Why is it so big and underground? The first thing that comes to mind is a secret repository, especially the blue level. 
We can only speculate at this point, but given its depth and monumental size, it could be the hidden storage place of those who were there before the pharaohs, and whatever stuff to preserve they put inside might still be there. And we wouldn't know until we got underground, either doing selective bore drilling or excavations. And it is better to do it fast until this monumental structure with its content disappears forever, eaten out by ground salt water that is already destroying the megalithic core of the Hawara Pyramid.